We're live. Hello, friends. I'm Jonathan Last from The Bulwark here with my buddy Tim Miller, also from The Bulwark. And we are joined by, uh, amazingly enough, Alexander Vindman, who is coming to us live from Kiev. Uh, Alex needs no introduction. Obviously, he is the husband of Rachel Vindman, one of the premier <laughs> podcast hosts of our day with the SWP show. Um, it must be a tremendous honor to be married to somebody that uh, that amazing, Alexander. Is it yes, it is. And I have to remind her of how lucky I am very often. Otherwise, <laughs> no. otherwise I get some of the heat that, you know, people on, on uh, Twitter and social media get if they get out of line. But yeah, it's uh, uh, lucky. Jonathan, I, so, I'm Alexander, here for the Vinman fangirling and the comic I will, relief. I will okay, do you be it. Serious. Let me let me let me do the real intro. So Alexander, obviously a uh, retired lieutenant colonel from the U.S. Army. He was director of European affairs for the NSC. Uh, he is a I'm sorry, I'm going to use the word anyway, a great patriot. And I'm a, a giant fanboy, even though we have just met 30 seconds ago. Uh, also, the author of a memoir here, Right Matters, an American Story. Um, you should all go and do yourselves a solid and go and buy it. I listen to it on Audible because I listen to all of my books and it's a, it's a fabulous, fabulous book. Um, okay. Alex, what just happened? Okay. Uh, that's it. Uh, you know, it's interesting. Uh, there is a lot of speculation about what caused this. I think I've got, you know, a pr probably about as good a, a, uh, analysis and summary as anybody else. Basically, this was uh, one crazy dude going nuts, losing his mind. That's Pergozin, who happened to be uh, to uh, to own a private military company, and having achieving uh, you know unexpected catastrophic success, threatened the very kind of uh, 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 foundation of Putin power. That's the soundbite. Uh, to get into it a little bit more, what's been going on for? For months now, you know, it's actually been longer than that. Probably, you know, some of the some of these issues had to have emerged back all the way back in 2018 when Prigozhin, uh, Prigozhin's folks, Wagner, went up against you know U.S. Delta uh, and just got shellacked, like 300 dead in uh, outside of uh, the city of Deir Ezzor in, uh, in western in Syria, and um, you know where they they called for support from the Russian military. And the Russian military was like, I don't know. We don't know who you guys are. I mean, of course they do. Uh, you know, Putin himself recently attested to the fact that uh, Wagner gets gets funded to the tune of about a billion dollars a year. It, it takes a lot to run a private army. Um, and he did this. You know, the Russians have been doing this for plausible deniability for all their nefarious dealings in North Africa and, and, and Central Africa, you know, basically uh, supporting um, authoritarian leaders and coups and things of that nature. But anyway, so if that was the seeds over the course of this war, which has gone terribly for the Russians for about 16 months, the uh, kind of probably the shock troops, the most effective troops have been uh, Wagner PMC. And uh, they got some of the hard tasks. They were told to secure uh, Bakhmut. It's uh, almost an irrelevant city uh, that's taken on huge symbolic meaning in eastern Ukraine. And after losing you know, tens of thousands of troops, uh, lots of them were convicts that the, that uh, Wagner recruited from from prisons. Um, they managed to to actually uh, evict, probably quite briefly, the the Ukrainian forces uh, at a very very heavy toll. But um, throughout the whole time, Prigozhin was complaining about how little support he was getting from the Russians, and part he was doing it as an excuse to say why explain why he you know his troops weren't weren't able to secure it earlier, but maybe there's a grain of truth to the fact that they weren't getting enough air support or artillery support and things of that nature. This all kind of came to a head because Prigozhin has been increasingly critical and he basically lost his mind and, you know, called uh, Shoigu, the head of the Russian, the Minister of Defense and the Chief of the General Staff, Gerasimov, like traitors and, you know, um, at which point the, those folks tried to roll Wagner back into the military saying we're you know we pay your bills anyway we're gonna you guys are gonna have to for, uh, be forced to sign on as uh, members of the armed forces and in a play to you know this was kind of inter internal fighting uh, or what in russian is called it as borka you know kind of settling out amongst mafia clans or something like that he made a play to do a demonstration and a march on on rostov and you know, potentially there was supposed to be a visit of the, of the Minister of Defense, Shoigu and, and Grasimov, and he was going to, you know, basically capture him and, you know, 
uh, extract his concession, which is reserve and control. Instead, what ended up happening is those guys weren't there. Maybe it's possible the FSB got word of it ahead of time. Those guys weren't there. So instead, he completely unopposed, made it to Rostov, seized the Southern Military District headquarters that's responsible for this war, you know, to the cheers of the population. And then because he was so successful, he's like, oh, you know what? Let's go just head up north. So he split a force and head up north. Again, completely unopposed made it to within 200 kilometers of, of uh, Moscow. Putin hopped on a plane, left. Oligarchs hopped on a plane, left. And uh, the, the the after, and then when, you know, he wasn't planning to topple Putin, he was actually thought he was doing a service, doing a solid to Putin by by highlighting how bad these these uh, military guys are. And he's being, the, he was serving the good king uh, by uh, identifying these corrupt actors and, and having him removed, but he wasn't ready to start a, a civil war so when he was called on it, he basically buckled and, and turned around and left. And of course, there's the nuances of Lukashenko, the strong man from Belarus coming in, you know, how this went down. If you listen to Lukashenko, he's like, well, Putin called me all hysterical and like, you know, weeping. And all, <laughs> you know, I, I was like, calm down, Putin, calm Sounds down. Familiar. I got, yeah, I, I, this is a dramatic reenactment. So calm down, Putin. I got this. Don't worry about it. He's like, oh, but he's not going to take the phone call. We can't do it. We can't do it. And he's like, no, don't worry, Putin. Lukashenko says, I got it. And, you know, P- P- Lukashenko so- solves the whole thing. So now uh, Prigozhin is potentially in hiding in, or in, you know, in exile in, in uh, Belarus. Putin's trying to do his own spin on you know, the fact that his country almost was toppled by by an actor that the, the government was paying and frankly a, an extension of the state and uh you know military didn't come in to to rescue him and really frankly it was a, you know a bluff or kind of calling Prigozhin that saved it so putin is obviously responsible he could have put a stop to this anytime uh he could have said nope uh, I, I just shut up Prigozhin. you know uh, um you're you're you, you have your job to do do it or something like that or firing uh Shoigu. i mean this is all putin's doing and he looks extremely kind of damaged now, uh, damaged in the eyes clearly of Lukashenko, who's like basically talking to him like he's a, like a kid brother or something like that, uh, and probably damaged in the eyes of you know China and every other place around the world. And he's putting some spin, you know, trying to uh, fake it until he makes it, say, believe, you know, with the, this impression that he's everything's under control. He's been doing some public appearances and bringing the military in behind, praising him for their valiant defense, which obviously didn't quite happen. Uh, and um, trying to demonstrate to himself that he's in control, as well as to the elites that uh, undergird the, the Putinist regime that he's in control, but nevertheless damaged. And, you know, uh, we're finding ourselves in a completely different situation than we were a week ago with regards to what Russia looks like internally, quite brittle, what uh, perceptions are around Ru- uh, Russia and Putin are around the world. Uh, the question is, in my view, is what the perceptions are in our own leadership. And right. that's what scares me a little bit is that our own leadership, you know, the Biden administration may draw the wrong lessons from this. All right. So I had a couple of questions that I'm going to let Tim, Tim come in and drive to. I'm sorry, Timothy. Um, no, please. The first, the first one very, I mean, this is honestly an academic concern, but I'm curious anyway. Uh, is this deal with Prigozhin a real deal or is he going to fall out of a, you know, a, a first floor window in a month? You know, it's it, it can't can't possibly be a real deal, um, just because the fact is that you know Putin needs to settle the score, in order to look like he's you know he's under he's got everything under control. He needs to settle the score. He can't have Pergozin potentially you know with with thousands of troops that may or may not be loyal to him out there in, in the position to potentially relaunch another coup. Uh, he needs to to, to squash him. Um, it seems to me a little bit hard. To, I mean, I understand what, what to a certain extent, why that hasn't happened yet, uh, because Putin needs to make sure that he kind of, frankly, under undermines the very um, foundations of, of Prigozhin's. Um, well, he has to uh, digest uh, Wagner, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah he, he has, has to digest, digest that. That's yeah. Exactly right. He has to digest Wagner, and then he could deal with Prigozhin in turn. And Prigozhin, you know, frankly, knows this. Uh, so it, does, it doesn't doesn't make a huge. He's he's not the smartest man, Pergozin. By the way, he's 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 just an effective thug. So uh, it's it's unclear how this is going to settle out. Um, I think there are implications for Pergozin. There's implications for Wagner. There's implications for the Russian armed forces. 
uh, the elites and frankly, the conduct of, the, of this war in Ukraine. So the, and the other question I have, this is a little bit more expansive. Um, I understand how this all reveals the brittleness of the, the Putin regime. And brittleness is like actually a very precise physics term for, you know, a kind of substance which can absorb a lot of stress, but then it cracks suddenly. Um, and there is brittleness to it. But on the other hand, the removal of Prigozhin removes one of the other existing power centers, right? I mean, there was this guy who had his own private armed forces and he did rely on the Russian Ministry of Defense for mm -hmm. command and control and support and logistics and all that stuff. But he had an independent force. He's gone out of the country and Putin is brittle. But on the other hand, like, where's the where's the rival power center? Yeah. And that's what I don't fully understand in terms of trying to trying to conceptualize what comes next. Sure. So first of all, I think uh, even if you ask Putin um, before this, Prigozhin was never a rival power center. It was never perceived as a threat. It's again, literally through mismanagement that he turned out to, to be a rival because he had his forces marched. But he was never kind of an independent actor. He was always right, somebody right. that you know, Putin had ultimately under control. So from the standpoint of like rival power centers, that that never existed. He was always beholden to Putin. Um, you know, chaos, accident. Um, turns out that the Russian security services internally to to... Russia are not in a position to defend against kind of an armed up uprising. Window and stairwell safety. Yeah, yeah, right, exactly. Yeah. So uh, I mean, I think the 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 fact is that you know the next next challenges, uh, as and I never was a big believer in the fact that you know he, Putin would be um, removed by a coup, but the next challenges could be from military potentially. That's not completely out of the realm realm of the question, uh, of the possible. Traditionally, the Soviet and the Russian military were not, you know, uh, strong political actors. There were times where they were, like there were some fig figures like uh, um, Zhukov uh, that had, uh, you know, some some political power. But in general, they, you know, they weren't a major force in um, either the 1991 uh, collapse of the Soviet Union. They made, mainly kind of stayed out of it. There were some some factions that, you know, that played a role ultimately in the pooch, but weren't, weren't kind of, this wasn't the entirety of the force rising up. So I think uh, there might be some, I guess what I'm trying to do is give some expectation management. Uh, I don't have put a lot of faith in the fact that the military could be the, uh, a major factor, but it has played out where the military, after taking huge losses and frankly, you know, tired of sacrifice, akin to, to, to you know, by size, by percentage, a large portion of the Russian military has been obliterated. Probably somewhere in the ballpark of per the same kinds of percentages, although I'd have, to, I'd have to check the figures, of 1917. The Russians mm -hmm. took enormous losses in 1917 and just basically left the battlefield. And uh, so that's still there. I think the elites as a whole may choose to go with stability, which is Putin, uh, and you know continue to back him. Or they may say, you know, we're, we're becoming increasingly er erratic uh, Putin's committing us to uh, to folly, so it might come from from elites. Again, a somewhat far fetched notion because uh, he, he exercises good control, but that might all be in the short term. In the long term, Putin does look weak. Uh, it might not play out in the course of you know the next months, mix, maybe even the next year, a couple year, a couple of years. But Putin is is weakened, and uh, I you know his staying power. I said this from the beginning of this war. This war is going to be so disastrous that this is going to be Putin's undoing. If anything, this just accelerates that 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 um, you know slide to to him being gone. Tim, yeah, you're in Kiev. I want to hear about um, the view from inside uh, Ukraine. Um, what kind of the conversations you're having, the buzz, what's the gossip, what are people whispering about about what they think is happening in Russia? Tell us about kind of the view from Kiev. Yeah, so you know, I think that the the uh, Ukrainians are quite practical. And I just got here, so I'm, I'm, most of my meetings are going to be occurring over the next couple of days, or next week or so. But uh, the initial kind of reads are that um, you know nobody freaking you know understands how, what exactly happened or played out. I think there's they there's they have a good understanding of that this was infighting amongst the elites, um, that this was unexpected uh, from Putin that things were, got this this far this ca carried this far forward. Uh, certainly, you know, Putin was well aware that the rivalry between Pagosin and, and Shoigu, 
uh, and people are, you know, are kind of shocked that it got to this point where the, the whole thing basically boiled over to, to armed insurrection. Uh, people died. You know, six uh, six helicopters and one aircraft were shot down. Uh, you know, a dozen pilots and, and crew uh, were killed. Um, so it was not a bloodless uh, affair. Um, but mainly, they're frankly concerned about the battlefield. They're concerned about the implication. You know, they were hoping, uh, and I think a lot of people were hoping that this this would have played out uh, with a collapse of the, the Russian military um, and that, you know, the Ukrainians could quickly liberate territory. That was probably, you know, uh, uh, a uh, beyond hope scenario because just that's not the way things, uh, that's not the, really the way things work. At least they're not there yet. Uh, because the fact is that the battlefield is really dissociated from what happened at the political level, at the strategic level. And the folks on the front lines are, you know, concerned about a couple of things. They're concerned about, you know, receiving paychecks. They're getting, they're getting paid quite I'm, a bit. I'm sorry, just the folks on the front line on the Russian side or the Ukrainian side? You, uh, on the on the Russian side. On the the Russian folks side. on the uh, front lines of the Russian side are getting paid a lot of money to to sit in foxholes, and, and they don't want to die, but you know they want to collect their paychecks, um, and they're they're basically going to do you know what what they're told to do by the tactical and operational leadership and the tactical and operational leadership was not affected by this the strategic leadership was so this right. actually does ultimately degrade the russian uh, uh the russian war against ukraine because those strategic leaders uh, all the way from the folks that were you know were captured and and uh uh, kind of um, under uh, Prigozhin's grasp for a short time when he controlled the Southern Military District. Those guys are are sus a bit. You know why didn't they put up a fight? Why why they let themselves get captured by Prigozhin? Um, there no sus. Is that a military term or a, or the Gen Z usage of sus? <laughs> I, I, I mean, I'm using it in the military form, but I think the Gen Z picked it up too. Okay. <laughs> uh, so um, so I think you know there's some questions about there uh, that those uh, folks. I think there's also, the, I mean, the effects are going to be, you know, uh, nuanced, but significant and over a longer period of time. They didn't collapse, but what we should expect is uh, the, the 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 fight relies on different tiers of leadership. And when things start to get difficult, the, the folks on the front lines are going to call for support. They're, and the, at some point, it's going to potentially run into impediments. What you end up having uh, in warfighting is reserves. You have operational and strategic reserves. Those operational reserves that are being put to plug to plug up holes right now that the Ukrainians are creating through their uh, offensive, that's fine. But when it comes to strategic assets, that's going to be challenging. Uh, I think that's going to where where the effect is. So we'll see this play out over the course of you know uh, weeks, and I think it's going to have an effect. Do you have a sense as to how many Wagner troops are now off the board because they were sent to Belarus? So uh, it's actually unclear how, I mean, I, maybe, I think the intelligence community may, I mean, we have excellent collection in the U.S. Um, um, military and intelligence community. We have relatively poor analysis, unfortunately. So uh, I don't know um, if anybody has a good, a particularly good bead. I think what we'll know when satellite images start showing up of, you know, the Wagner camp, how many people left. But in the meantime, it's probably not that much. Most of them are probably still kind of you know, inside uh, the armed forces bubble. So now the Russian armed forces have to both fight a war and guard against thousands of troops, um, right. you know, in in their, in their the rear areas. So some of those, that's one of the reasons those reserve forces that I was talking about, those strategic reserve forces are not going to be as easily committed because they need to be guarding against thousands of troops. But I think ultimately, um, you know, it'll be a, a mixed bag. Um, I, I, my instinct is that folks in the uh, uh, Wagner PMC were getting paid a huge amount of money to do the fighting. Uh, the uh, armed forces of Russia are not going to pay them the same kind of money. Uh, they, those guys would prefer to go off and fight in Africa for like you know their large paychecks. So I don't know if a lot of the, uh, how many of them are actually going to get absorbed into the, into the Russian military. You kind of implied this, but just on the Ukrainian counteroffensive, just this. To be more specifically, so your sense is that you know the progress there, you know, remains slow, or, or I don't want to put words in your mouth. How, how do you how do you define it? So it, it is it was never going to be you know uh, a days long or you know even a weeks long affair. Uh, I've been saying this consistently. When all is said and done, by by fall, uh, late fall, 
uh, Ukraine is going to achieve its its operational objectives. It's going to secure the kinds of terrain that make the situation basically nearly untenable for Russia without a call up of hundreds of thousands of more troops, which, by the way, Putin's going to be increasingly reluctant to do because of the instability that's going to create. You know, there is already a sense from the population that they're not that they, they support Wagner. They're not interested in, in, you know, they buy into the fact that this war is not going well. Um, so I think the, the Ukrainians are going to do well right now. The problem is this. The Ukrainians are facing a well-defended, and the Russians are, are trained on defense pretty extensively. I mean, you know, their officers do, in particular, on drills on how to conduct it. The, the layers of mines are a particular problem. The layers of mines have made it very, very slow go for the Ukrainian military because they have to clear, you know, they have to clear every inch of space before they move forward. The areas that are not mined maybe even better defended because you have to cover your, 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 you know, you're going to cover your areas in front of you. Um, mine feels a little bit less because there, there are mines there to block. If you think about it from this way, if you have a, a dense minefield, you only need a smaller number of uh, troops to overwatch it. But if you don't have those mines in a, in a particular space, then you need more force. You need other, uh, other things to make up for uh, ways to slow down the, the, the advance. So it's easier for the Ukrainians to fight in places where there are no less minefields than when there are dense minefields, even if those minefields are not very seriously overwatched. So that's what they're contending with. They're, it's a slow go. They're going to slowly make progress. They are making pro slow progress pretty much on all fronts. It's just gonna get, going to be um, you know, painful and costly. And the U.S. in particular has to be there, as well as NATO, but the U.S. has to be there to, you know, to backfill weapons, to provide additional resources. That, that's coming through. There was another announcement, you know, over the past 24 hours of additional aid. It needs to come, you know, about as quickly as as it can go in order to sustain this uh, offensive. Uh, Alexander, I want to be mindful of your time here. Uh, I, I guess last question, um, unless I you have, have one more else, on Tim. Biden. Go yeah. You, yeah, you go gonna, first, Tim. I'll yeah, one more yeah, Biden. You said if you it's one. interesting, we could go longer. I guess it's interesting, right? That's true. It's it been interesting, interesting to me, but yeah. I, I worry about yeah, your you're time. You're guilty That's of all. your own interest. Um, okay. okay, just really quick. Uh, you uh, you said something that piqued my interest at the end of your first answer, which was you're worried that the Biden administration is going to get the wrong message. So what's the right message for the Biden administration? All right. Well, yeah. I'm glad that you followed up on that one. I, was, <laughs> I, left, that, I left the dangling out there. Um, so I'm a little I'm 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 concerned because of my research. I just finished my doctoral dissertation on U.S. policy towards Russia and Ukraine since 1991, and one of the conclusions was that the U.S. looked for you know mirages of stability. Uh, the stability of preserving Gorbachev as the, the general secretary of the Communist Party, even after he was toast. Uh, same thing with with, you know, basically Yeltsin when um, when he was under under threat from other forces. We basically went all in on these uh, on these folks for this mirage of stability, when frankly, the lesson should be that we there are think there are. There are complexities way beyond our control. We can't, even though we're a superpower, we can't control everything. We don't control what happens internal with Russia. Russia start, started this folly of a war and it's re reaping the whirlwind. It's going to get increasingly complex. It's going to get increasingly unstable the longer it goes. So the biggest urgency here is to help Ukraine win as quickly as possible to avoid these black swan scenarios, these unexpected scenarios from unfolding over a longer time horizon. This, and, and the theory that you're incrementally Going, going to see, you're going to see incremental uh, escalations from Putin, chipping away at, at uh, you know areas that we th thought were kind of red lines or or uh, ceilings to his activity. So my concern is that the Biden administration takes too cautious an approach, chooses to not, uh, you know, to, chooses to apply some pressure on on the Zelensky government to, as we've seen them do over the course of this past weekend, right or wrong, they said don't don't. Don't muck around in, in Russia proper. Uh, don't you know? No need to go in there. Uh, let's let's let, let things play out. But that's the, you could see the tone there is you know deep caution instead of recognizing that you know, there's an urgency to support Ukraine to act to help wind down this war quickly to get to the point where Putin's position is untenable and he's forced to negotiate. That is doable. We just haven't done it so far. So my my you know one of the most immediate things that the administration could do, in addition to this aid, is we have a NATO summit coming up, June uh, July 11th and 12th in Vilnius. That is a very meaningful summit. In 2008, 
uh, we went too far and not far enough. The Bush administration um, rallied, you know, tepid support to extend, an, uh, you know, this this rhetoric of Ukraine and Georgia will ultimately join NATO, but without when. And that provoked the Russians within months, you know, they, inv they invaded Georgia and things of that nature. We cannot have a relive of that scenario. We cannot basically, you know, rely on rhetoric to uh, to make up for action. I am. I started this war deeply skeptical about the possibility of uh, inviting Ukraine into NATO. My my going my position now is to extend NATO a membership to Ukraine. Concrete that does not imply in any way Article Five immediately. That is not the way Article Five works. It's it's a consultation process. So well, there is definitely a way to do this. Whether it's bounding uh, Article Five to to or territory that Ukraine currently controls, or it's you know some other template that I'm not smart enough to think of at the moment, but there is absolutely a way to extend NATO membership, kill this dream from Putin that he has a veto over Ukraine's NATO membership, though as long as he's in, inside Ukraine, Putin does, believes he has a veto. As long as he's in Ukraine, he uh, uh, we can't extend NATO membership to Ukraine. We need to kill that dream. And basically say, you know, we we are prepared to defend our NATO territory, which Ukraine is a member, without offensively, you know, targeting Russia or going after Russia. And there's a way to do that. There's a way to thread that needle. Our our policymakers are smart enough to do this. Start with the premise of Ukraine is in NATO, and then work your way back. Figure out what you what control measures, what risk measures you need to do in order to realize this this vision. And for God's sakes, stabilize the European flank end this prospect of, of war from Russia in perpetuity, as long as Ukraine lies out. So that's the, you know, that is, I, I'm going to sign on to, to a letter from, with many, many senior policymakers and, and generals on this topic. This needs to happen. I urge the, the Biden administration to relook this, relook it in the context of the reality of the, of this Biden, uh, of this um, insurrection and with a, a better, keener eye on what the real risks of escalation are and with a keen eye on the long-term stability of Europe and how to wind down this war that threatens to, to frankly, you know, over the course of a long time horizon engulf Europe and, and maybe the, the world. Do it. Uh, do you know, I'm, I am deeply sympathetic to that. Um, do you, do you think you have to expand e the EU first or can you, can you do, can you do NATO first without finishing you, EU ascension for the Ukraine? You could, you could do that. You could definitely do it. They're, they're two different things. EU actually has its own and, and the wording in the EU um, um, charter actually provides pretty strong assurances, security assurances. There's no teeth to it because the right. EU doesn't really have an, a, a military force to speak of. Uh, but um, so there is, uh, there, you definitely want to get there. You want that because uh, ultimately it could bring Ukraine, Ukraine uh, govern, uh, you know, law and governance uh, into line with European standards. But there's a, you know, this is a false narrative that uh, you need to have everything in place before you could extend NATO. That's not what happened with gotcha. the first countries that joined NATO, you know, uh, in the early 2000s. You can have NATO be the transforming agent. Gotcha. Uh, Alexander Vindman joining us from Kiev. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, please be safe out there and uh, best of luck to everyone in Ukraine who's fighting on behalf of all of us. Appreciate you so much, Alex. Great American. Thank you for doing Thanks. this. Thanks. This is a great conversation. Uh, I intend to, to hit these talking points many times over the coming weeks before NATO. So <laughs> all right. thanks for me we'll, we'll make sure. I, I have a feeling we have a few White House people that peek in on us at the bulwark. So we'll make sure we get it to them. <laughs> Great. Thanks. We'll see you, man.